Good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Olson Day of the New York Times, and I am so excited to welcome you to this Times Talks tonight. We're live here at the Times Center in New York, and we're live around the world on the web. We're thrilled to have tonight's guest on our stage. She is one of the most influential singer, songwriter, musicians in contemporary music, and she's also an actress. Her industry has awarded her its highest accolades, seven Grammys with an additional 14 nominations, a Golden Globe nomination, and 12 Juno Awards. And she sold more than 60 million albums worldwide. In 1995, her debut album, Jagged Little Pill, swept the Grammy Awards and went on to sell 16 million copies in the United States and 28 million worldwide. She will release her highly anticipated seventh studio album, Havoc and Bright Lights, on August 28th. You'll hear much more about her and the new album from our moderator, who I'm so pleased to introduce. In the 22 years that he's been chief pop music critic for The Times, he has watched U2 record an album in Dublin, spent an evening at Radiohead's favorite pub, and been personally denounced from the stage of Madison Square Garden by Axl Rose <laughs> twice. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming John Pirellis and our very special guest, Alanis Morissette. Thanks for being here, folks. Thanks for all coming out. And thank you, Alanis, for coming. Um, for let's, coming. let's start with the present. Um, I want to ask you about Guardian. Um, it's, 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 um, the single is out. The album is delayed. Um, but <laughs> I prefer to say it's just percolating. It's percolating? Well, yeah. well actually, why was, it, why, did you, why was it delayed? Um, it was delayed for uh, uh, numerous reasons, mostly just because internationally we wanted to make sure everyone received the record at a respectable and respectful of their timelines, because once a record comes out on the internet, yes. uh, it's pretty much international release. <laughs> so out of respect for the planet and their needs, we waited a hot second. But, but tell me about Guardian, because that's, I mean, that's a very charged word for you. You've used that word in other songs, in, in yeah. front row. Um, who are you guarding in that song? I can't quite tell. <laughs> uh, the chorus is about my guardianship and protector ship of my son, um, who's a year and a half old. And then I realized quickly after um, I gave birth to him that if I wasn't taking care of my own inner child in a significant way, that I wouldn't be able to sustain the motherhood role. So the verses are about my taking care of myself. Really? Officially. But it's still that, that person's someone you don't trust. That person yeah. has promises like fog. Yeah, well, my, uh, my inner parent was influenced by my upbringing. So I think we, we parent ourselves the way we've seen parenting be modeled for us, is my thought. So I had to unlearn a bunch of stuff and, and basically grow my parent up because I wasn't, I wasn't uh, guarding myself very well. Well, I mean, I was thinking, were your parents stage parents? Were they pushing you? Um, there were some vicarious elements to, I think, more my, on my dad's side. Um, they're influenced, and they were influenced, in the same way that I think the planet's been influenced, which is the ego, sort of the gratifying aspects of what fame seems to offer and success and, you know, the perfectionism approach to all of that. So it was only as I got older when I could see um, the anti-life or the, the sort of kindness annihilating part of just fame as a goal. I wrote mm -hmm. a song, Celebrity, about that because I just felt like that as a singular goal was a little hollow and, um, and it made for uh, a lot of challenges. Yeah, no, I, I, celebrities on the new album, which 
has one of the craziest, most wonderful productions, that song. I hope, mm. I hope when people get to hear it. Mm. Um, the song is sort of slipped out, right? It's on a Guitar Center performance or something. So people may have heard it, I guess. Mm. Um, but I mean, in that song, the, the, person, the narrator is going to do anything for celebrity. Right. It's sort of a busting my own chops story and <laughs> busting the chops of Hollywood in general and the obsessive, high-valued aspect of, of fame at all costs, you know, at the cost of well-being, at the cost of sanity. And uh, it, it hasn't really offered or afforded the things that I thought it would. But did you ever give yourself over to it that much? I mean, because you've always, we met a decade ago. Mm -hmm. You seemed to be pretty level-headed then. You weren't, yeah. you know, radically transforming yourself to become famous. No, there was the, the carrot was definitely dangled from a young age, though, so I had to counter that, even on an unconscious level. You know, there were so many times where I chose fame well over my well-being, you know, on countless occasions, and I think having decided that fame could be used as a tool to serve my life purpose, it became a lot more exciting, so. When did, when did you figure that out? After people responded to Jagged Little Pill, I could see that, um, I could see that there was a reason for my to, for me to continue going. There was a reason for that versus my just doing it for ego gratifying reasons. Mm. Um, so there was a servicefulness that was infused in all the t choices I made. But I could see that if I didn't take care of myself, I would be a hypocrite. You know, well, you'd also be a wreck. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, I'm still a wreck. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I just <laughs> discovered coffee. <laughs> Aha. Now I'm a jittery wreck. Mm -hmm. Hand shaking while you play the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, did, did you know Jagged Little Pill was going to reach so many people? No. Um, I think on a practical level, the, the team around me at the time thought, and I thought they were being uh, a little um, arrogant to think this. They were thinking that it would sell 100,000 copies. And well, certainly when I was writing it, and, and thankfully to this day when I write, I'm so insulated that I'm actually not thinking about the song being shared publicly when I'm in the writing process. So I was in a little vacuum and I just knew there was a real potency and urgency to the writing for me. The songs were written really quickly in 20 or 30 minutes each and that continues mm. to be the process to this day. So I just knew there was some intensity and that's all I really knew. And that I was going to show up for it 100%. You mean to, to promote it, to, to talk about it, to get on the road? Yeah. The, no, I mean, you, that's, I mean, that's part of the drill is, is all pushing that giant machine. Yeah, and especially with my having been, tw you know, I think I was 19 and 20 when I wrote the record, and then when we toured, I was 21. So I had no other priorities. You know, I didn't have anyone that I was responsible for. So that's the time to be in the van or the bus. Yeah. W but when you wrote those songs, did you, did you think, I'm really letting down my guard? Um, um, I mean, a song like You Ought to Know is, is, is more explicit than a 19 or 21 year old usually yeah. gets to be. Yeah. Um, I didn't think about it that way. I just thought, I'm alone in this room, and I might as well uh, sort of approach this songwriting process much like how I approach writing in my journal, which is, you know, total lack of censorship. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people have mentioned, you know, have, have spoken about the thought that it's really cathartic to do that. And on, on a certain level, it certainly is. But that can't be, for me, mistaken as healing. You know, the, the act of writing and moving the energy is lovely. Uh, it could be a catalyst for, you know, further healing. But, um, but in and of itself, singing You Ought to Know over and over again for years on stage, it didn't really take care of the situation. <laughs> huh. I, 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 <laughs> So, 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 so the wound was stayed open? Yeah. Wow. Just a little salt every night. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah. but, but you're smiling afterwards, so. Yeah. yeah. I found actually uh, getting the same courage or applying the same courage that I showed in the writing process to my day-to-day -day interactions with people, risking expressing my anger or risking expressing my vulnerability in my day-to-day -day relationships has wound up being the most healing part of things, not necessarily just having written about it in songs. So the songs taught you how to act? They taught me how to grow up. Wow. So, I mean, do you, do you look at um, your old journal sometimes and think, I knew that girl, but I'm not that girl? Wit girl. There's so the girl many who, of them. <laughs> yeah, well, those girls. I mean, the yeah. girl who wrote the, the journal oh, oh. when she was 19. Yeah, no, I love her. <laughs> her hair's a little greasy, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she, is, she, is she as strong as you are now? 
Yeah, I'm much stronger now. She was more reactive, mm -hmm. which I think is a rite of passage for a 19-year-old, especially in the context of what was happening with women during that time and my having been brought up and raised in a patriarchal kind of even misogynistic environment a lot of times. Um, I was responding to my having contained and repressed for so long that while it may have been surprising to some, the content of Jagged Little Pill, for the people who knew me well, it wasn't surprising at all. That they thought you, you finally? They just said, thank God you're speaking about it, finally. <laughs> well, well, I think that was the reaction to the, the millions of people, to people here probably, who, who heard it and, and thought, you know, somebody's finally saying it. Mm. I mean, did, 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 did the spokeswoman role occur to you when you were doing it? Well, I think the word responsibility at 21 freaked me out. I didn't <laughs> want to feel responsible for people, but I had no problem volunteering to be on the front lines and potentially getting my head chopped off. I feel like that was what I was born to do. <laughs> keep, keep, keep the head on, though. It's, yeah, yeah. Um, it's less disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, no, I mean, I, I've, I've been to Glenn Ballard's studio. I mean, mm -hmm. you were singing in a room basically the size of, the size of a closet, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and yet you were singing to the, to the world. I didn't know that at the time, but now <laughs> I do, yeah. I mean, the, uh, it, it was, I mean, it's a very private environment to be, to be making quiet. that stuff. And bless him, because it was very warm and safe. And I think I'd collaborated with so many people leading up to that moment, even as a teenager. And there were a lot of people who had an agenda when they met me, you know, whereas Glenn just had this open heart and the equipment was ready and the, the environment was warm and he just said, let's see what you want to write about. And that was the ideal listening for me to speak to musically. Yeah, just, just a sympathetic ear and a good yeah. drum track. And, and a, a high capacity for, you know, charged content. You know, he's a brave soul. Did, did, he, did he edit you? Did you learn to edit or, or was that just how it poured out? He did the opposite, actually. He, um, you mean edit as in the songs or the yeah. censorship of the content? Uh, edit the song, say, you know, shape the song, you're telling a story here, clear it up. I had learned how to create the structure of a song in my teen years, mm -hmm. so I think I learned that part of the craft, per se. Even the word craft kind of freaks me out a little bit, but um, the <laughs> <Good> craft, <job. laughs> it's, it's the sort of other side of the brain. But um, I learned the craft as a teenager, so when I met Glenn, we both were crafts people. Mm -hmm. So, so, so. You, you were, as a teenager, you were pretty much Alanis Morissette. Yeah, well, I was Alanis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big difference. Well, what's the difference? No, I'm joking, and I'm not. I mean, as a teenager, um, I wasn't as prepared to write about what was going on with me autobiographically, and I was working with the kind of personality that had, um, that had an agenda for, for what I was up to. Mm -hmm. and, Beautifully so, really, at the time, I wasn't ready to write the way that I write now. Right. But, but when you, but 1920, you were writing, you were writing adult songs already. Well, I wouldn't, I promised myself that I wouldn't stop until I wrote a record that felt really resonant and really aligned. And so I literally wrote hundreds of songs, songs that are floating out there right now with my name on it, but, but weren't really my songs. Hmm. No, and you, um, I, I, you, you always talk about filling journals before you start an album. Mm -hmm. um, how many before this one? This one had probably four, but I'm, I'm getting a little bit better now at just writing down one line that I know will kickstart a song. So now it's the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so, so you text yourself with the next, the next song title? Yeah, I email myself a lot. <laughs> it's a good way to do it. It works. <laughs> no, and, 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 it's, and it's there to search for when you need it. Exactly. Technology. Ah. <laughs> Love it. Um, iPhones and drum machines, right? Exactly. You can do a record in your bathroom now on the way to work. Well, how did, how did you do the new one? Say again? How did you do the new album? Um, I had just given birth to my son ever, so I, I'm an attachment parent, so I wanted to make sure that I was available for him, and yet at the same time, my vocation was, you know, basically this sort of imperative. So I built a makeshift studio in our living room in the house, and I would write the songs in this living room and be on call for my son and, and invited Guy Sigsworth to come over from London, and we'd done it before, so there was right. a familiarity. No, I'm sorry, there's, um, no, there's a great leap in your sound with um, Flavors of Entanglement, which you also made with him. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> he understands your, uh, 
he hears you well, I think. Yeah, he hears me well and he's titillated by it and he's a really smart, heartful artist. You know, I think in those contexts, I've had the privilege of being invited to write with a lot of people, but it takes a certain kind of person for me to feel comfortable in their hands. So, so four journals, and, and did you comb through them and, and, yeah. and, and, and think? You actually said something somewhere where um, you said you look through your journals and you find the, the part that scares you most, and yeah. that's when you write the song. Yeah, anything that terrifies me, I want to sign up for. So, so, uh, so which song on the album? Did Guardian terrify you? Um, the idea of attuning to myself that consistently terrified me, because I didn't you know, it was one thing to write a 20-minute song every few years, but mm. for me to commit to being that consistently attuned to myself is such a tall order even to this moment. <laughs> yeah. So that was a little terrifying. The idea of taking on the role of motherhood, you know, intellectually, cognitively, it made sense as something that I wanted to do, but it's a head spinner. Yeah, well, I mean, you said at the end of Flavor's Entanglement, in, in complete, you said, I want to be married, I want to have kids, and yeah. two years later, look at you. Yeah, there's manifestation <laughs> ability in the songs. I have to be careful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'm thinking um, there's a song on the album called Spiral mm -hmm. that, that seems very open to the, to, and probably scary to write. I mean, was that one of the scary ones? Yeah, the whole idea of shame, you know, and how I can just go down a certain road that takes me all the way down, and that it, it is actually possible to have interdependence be a goal. You know, there was this whole movement um, toward autonomy for a long time. I think it was in the sort of post-feminist era. It's all about everyone being autonomous and singular. And so I tried that approach for a while, and, and um, you know, alone with my journal, alone with a therapist who had great boundaries or alone. It didn't really work because I felt like the healing was going to be in relationship. So Spiral, the chorus, is really about it's, it's okay and it's a sign of maturity for me to reach out and express vulnerability in appropriate, appropriate mm. environments. Wow. So, so uh, yeah, no, uh, no more solo acts. Not anymore. It doesn't really work for me. The, um, well, you actually, you, um, I mean, you've been, you've been blogging too, which is another, you're, it's, you seem to be looking those are long blog entries, and you look really <laughs> deeply inward. Yeah, it's exhausting. Um, I mean, are those like journal entries? No. That's, journal that's entries writing. Journal entries are more cryptic and um, sort of shorthand. And writing an article, I, I feel, speaking of responsibility, I feel uh, really like brain crunchy pressure to make sure I distill as much as I possibly can in a short, pithy little piece. Um, so, yeah. Welcome to journalism. Hi. <laughs> it's tough. I mean, it's so much harder to write an article for me than it is to write a song. Vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, the, uh, the, but I mean, it, it seems like I mean, there are, there are threads through all your albums. I mean, you're, you're fighting for self-esteem. You're fighting to get respect. Um, you're fighting to love yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, do you see through lines between your songs? I mean, do you think, you know, I'm still working on that one? Well, I think the through line, if anything, it's about relationships, or relationship with one's own self, relationship with other, husband, research and development and dating. You know, they're all chronicled, <laughs> whether that's, you know, whether they're horrifying or not. And then relationship with spirit. You know, that seems to be something that kind of filters through everything that I write at the end of the day. I was actually, I, I, I was struck, I, I've been listening to your albums all week. Nice work if you can get it, right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, but I was struck by how much you use Indian modes. Sooner or later, uh, um, there's always kind of an Indian drone or a sitar or something. Mm -hmm. Like um, the chord choices. I like the Eastern chord choices because I, I think of chords in terms of color. So the primary ones, the you learn, yellow, red, blue primary, and then, um, and then some of the other, you know, uninvited songs are more purple and brown and chartreuse. So, <laughs> what's, what's a chartreuse song? <laughs> chartreuse would be um, Guardian would be chartreuse because it's the primary. So there's that sort of uplifting chord harmonic choice, but then you throw in a fifth or you throw in a diminished chord, and the content can be a little more complicated. So it renders it not just yellow. So, so there's there's a there's a there's a darkness in it or something. Yeah, a challenge. A challenge. <laughs> a, a dissonance that yeah. you have to resolve. Yeah, 
And huh. sometimes the songs resolve, and there's a little bow tied at the end, and sometimes <laughs> they don't. Kind of like movies, you know. At the end of those songs, it's a little horrifying and must move on to happy ending song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, what, what, was, was the album all done? I mean, I can't imagine the, the ADD quality of having your child while you're trying to concentrate around while you're trying to write its song. I mean, yeah. was it, it must have been a very different process from the previous albums. Yeah, and I think the greatest moment of release for me was realizing that I'll never be single focused probably ever again. <laughs> you know, there's always going to be a part of me that's aware of my family and aware of my larger context family and I kind of let go of ever thinking that I'll be how I was when I was 19, even though when I was 19, I was thinking about a million things at once anyway. So I think that's also part of the diffuse awareness that women have physiologically. We're kind of born to be aware of 43 things at the same time. It's how we survive. <laughs> Multitaskers. Yeah, we're good at it. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a unitasker myself. Are you? <laughs> but you have to go shoot the deer and bring it home. <laughs> <laughs> And you have to cook it. <laughs> I, <have> to. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I have to breastfeed. Make sure your home is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where we go from like, How do we get here? <laughs> I mean, do, you, do, you, um, do you look back and, and, and feel you know, proud that you kind of open doors for people? I mean, I, I think of someone, I mean, whether or not they acknowledge it, people like, well, A Avril Lavigne, um, Lady Gaga maybe, uh, Adele, they all owe something to your getting out there with Jagged Little Pill and, and you know, letting it hang out, telling, telling, as, telling it as clearly as possible. Yeah, maybe in a similar way that I perhaps would owe that to Tori Amos and Sinead O'Connor and even Bonnie Raitt and just a bunch of artists who influenced me. And I think I def my ego takes a little bit of credit for you know, being a part of the movement, but at the same time, I know that it was happening in culture in general, that there was a wave of women becoming less apologetic about their alpha ways. There was a day where we'd be burned at the stake for, for even thinking some of the things that I write about. So I'm aware that the planet is changing and that there's more of an openness to having a complicated woman express herself. Um, and, and not be obliterated for it. So I think I was part of that, you know, I was on the crest of that movement. So you were, you were a flotsam of history. Yeah. But you steered the boat a little bit. I did, and I, and I think I was born to distill complicated subjects. You know, when I'm, I'm such a geeky student, you know, I love going to lectures and, and my, my brain just operates that way. I'll be taking in all this information in a book or otherwise, and my goal is to distill it into four or five sentences, so. Well, what are you soaking up these days? Um, neurobiology. <laughs> really? It's pretty sexy. Um, a, lot of, a lot of corroboration of what we've known spiritually, sort of the new thought movement or the spiritual communities are having science corroborate what they've sort of, quote unquote, known all along. So, um, you know, I'm part of a, a, I guess it's an organization called Relationships First with Harville Hendricks and John Gottman and Dan Siegel. And we're, um, we're creating this organization to, to support the nurturance of all these different relationships that I described a few minutes ago and come up with campaigns and programs to spread the message that it's the relationships that we have that really dictate what our planet looks like. So I feel born for that as well. So using both sides of the brain to speak to um, how there can be this wholeness moved toward in as graceful a way as possible, but often it's messy. And, and the other half of the relationship has to participate too. Yeah, I mean, you can come to the plate, but, and Lord knows I've, you know, had relationships with people who maybe said they wanted to come to the plate, but then they didn't. Well, they're all in the songs, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're all yeah. in unsent, actually. Exactly. <laughs> and all the extra verses. Yeah, exactly. Um, do, do, uh, do the people you write about ever say, Alanis, you know, you shouldn't have told people that, or were they proud? Well, I don't tell, I don't speak about their names or give right. addresses. You're not Taylor Swift. Does she, I don't think, does she? She, she names names. Oh, there you go. Um, I don't do that, but my thought is that if someone's calling me up and saying, how could you? My thought is, well, it's interesting that you recognized yourself in that song. Because <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Carly Simon and you're so vain. Yeah, right? yeah. The, the you great go. mystery. <laughs> yeah. But uh, does it come with an apology? No. 
<laughs> the song is never written to seek revenge as such. It's more written to get it out of my body, I think. No, I mean, you, you, you exorcise. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, I mean it, it's, it's one of the big mechanisms in your songs. Yeah. I mean, but, but you said you don't feel relief, which kind of shocks me. I feel relief in the moment, but it's a temporary relief. It's not a healing of the cells and healing of the situation to the point where I can move on. You're not done with it? No. Are you ever done with it? Well, I think it's an, there's an ongoing healing that, that is happening, and I think part of the charm of growing older is, uh, for me anyway, is that things get healed. And, it, and for relationships, I think commitment and intimacy is, is, is the hotbed for healing. So the more I commit to relationships and friendships and even professional relationships, and the more intimate I allow myself to be with them, the more room there is for healing. And, if, and equally, if I keep myself oh, separate from that, I kind of swim, swim in the wounds for too long, I think. Yeah, we get good songs out of them. There you go. <laughs> See, you can write songs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I think I'll have to take a correspondence course. <laughs> um, the, uh, but I mean, the, I mean, I, I see a change from you as, as a kid because your your songs are more, as you say, more interdependent as mm -hmm. as as you through the albums. Yeah, I think there's so many different archetypes and animals, and I've always been the connector. You know, I've always mm. wanted to connect, and I had a lot of shame about that for a long time because I happened to be in some relationships with people who were specifically avoidant of it. So I just thought there was something wrong with me. But now that I'm in the appropriate circles, <laughs> I feel like it's been normalized. Actually, you wrote this great phrase in one of your blogs that marriage was going to be the sweltering sweat lodge of truth. <laughs> yeah. That sounds kind of difficult. Yeah. Well, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It but can be, you know. I don't. For me, I, I had no intention of being in a relationship where I would stay asleep. Right. Yeah. Or, or, or be the beta female, or be the. Yeah, and I tried. You know, I, I tried being the beta female in a lot of relationships, and it just didn't last too long. It wasn't overly harmonious. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you might be a little too strong-willed for that role for very long. Yeah, and I love service, but I love service being in the driver's seat. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, um, the, uh, when you, when you how, do, how do you turn a journal entry into, into a song? Does the, does the melody come to you? Do you, um, do you like start singing the lyrics and go for the chords? Or? Uh, the music and lyrics are often written at the same time. So really? sometimes the chords themselves will beget certain words. And even phonetically, I'll just I'll sing sounds, and then the words will come. And sometimes I'll listen back to the tape and think, oh, I think I was saying, I think I was saying those words. So it's all. Sometimes it's a puzzle piece, and other times I'll start with one sentence that I know I want to have be the chorus, or, um, and then other times I have absolutely nothing going in. I just have an empty page, <laughs> and we see what happens that day. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, a lot of your songs are also lists. Mm -hmm. Like hand in my pocket, um, the uh, twenty-one things, mm -hmm. eight. They're now three things. <laughs> They're now three things. <laughs> oh, really? What, what are the three? <laughs> we were rehearsing for this European tour that we're going on, and just performing that song, I was giggling to myself about the high standards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you say you came down to what? What did you come down to? Shared value system with with what commitment meant. So being able to sit in the hot kitchen, um, so that muscle of tenacity, um, you know, family and service through art were the three pretty big ones to have in common with my husband. So you're living up to those yourself too. Oh yeah, have to. <laughs> so yeah. The, the, you hold yourself to the same high standard. Yeah, I don't know if it's a high standard. It's just a standard at this point. You're used to it. Yeah, maybe it's brave to some, but. It, it's kind of the norm in, in the circles that I hang in. Yeah. What, what are you playing on tour? I mean, because you've got, you've got a huge catalog now. You've got a lot of songs to choose from. Yeah, we're playing three or four new songs. Um, and then we're playing songs from the last, is it 17 years? Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of right. peppered. Yeah. The, when, when you went back to Jagged Little Pill in, in uh, 2005, did, did you, did, did, did you, have a different attitude about it? 
I mean, when you did the acoustic versions? We'd done so many acoustic versions for radio shows, right. so it was exciting to actually record them formally. And I love the new versions. Some of them harmonically we changed, like Hand in My Pocket, and, um, and then some of the um, more guitar-based ones we approached but with piano. So it was really self-indulgent. And <laughs> it, you know, to come up with a way to honor a 10-year anniversary without being overly precious about it, it was a challenge. So I thought, let's do it through reinterpretation and music. Did, did the words mean different things to you, having grown up? Um, yeah, the song Perfect took on a new, um, a new importance to me, just the whole epidemic of perfectionism, especially in the West, but in the planet, on the planet too, but um, just how, how much everything can, um, how challenging everything was seeing it through the lens of having to be perfect and wanting to control things. So that song was lovely in that way. Well, I was thinking the perfect's also about parenting, too. Yeah, being mm -hmm. on the receiving end of that message from, from the parents. I mean, so they, is, that, is that your, your sort of what not to do as a parent now yourself? Um, it's, it's an approach that I'm taking intuitively, this parenting approach, and I'll notice, you know, I'll, I'll see the tenderness and the sweetness of my son, and I'll think, wow. Can I give this to myself at the same time as I give it to him? Especially the things that I didn't, I wasn't even aware of not having received, you know. Yeah. So it's very healing to offer it and be the source of something that I, I think would be so sweet to receive. Well, it, it's synergistic too, right? Yeah, exactly. You get, you get more as you give more. Yeah. But that, that, that song, that song's still meaningful though too. I mean, yeah. but the other thing is, I mean, you're a band leader. You're a, you're, you're, you're the, you're the name on the album. I mean, you do have to be in control and perfect and, and make something excellent. Yeah, I, I love excellence. Um, but I believe now, through experience, that there's a way to have that, you know, that high competency and high responsibility and high sort of quality, whether it's smells, sensual, whether it's food, whether it's whatever it is. So there's, it's taste. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have to beat myself up and be controlling as such in order to have that happen. I'm allowing the self-selection process to happen too. If it's in professional relationships or in general, if the person I'm working with doesn't ha share that value with me, then we're probably not a match. So they're gone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but I mean, you, you work consistently with people. I mean, you, you, you've You've hooked up with people that you've kept. Yeah, I love long-term relationships. If, if <laughs> Musical ones them. too. Yeah, I love I love the idea of creating a shared history with people. It's awesome. It, who's in the band? Um, two new bandmates: Mike Farrell on keyboards and Julian Coriel on guitar, mm. and then Jason Oram, whom, whom I've played with forever, on guitar, and Cedric Lemoyne on bass, and Victor and Drizzo on drums. So, so these guys who sort of the guys you played with for a while, did they? They know that if you like turn your head like this, they have to do a certain thing. Or yeah. I mean, is there like a secret language? There is, <laughs> and uh, they are a great reflection of of what I sometimes don't always have the objectivity on in terms of the growth. I don't always have objectivity on who I am, and so when I hear people say things, it's uh, hmm. fascinating. <laughs> um, but my bandmates, when I look at them, I think, wow, I must have matured because. These are five grown-up, talented, kick-ass guys. So this is good. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I mean, do you, do, you, um, do, you, do you, does the audience, you must get a lot of mail. You must get a lot of response from your fans. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, do you get stories, you changed my life? I think the stories that are most touching to me are the ones where they share with me that a certain song or a record was a soundtrack to a certain period in their life. So that's an honor for me to think that someone had me as their partner in crime or someone had me to listen to when things were tough or it helped them through a divorce or helped them through some transition. The thought that I could do that without physically being there is the greatest thing I could imagine. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you've written, so a lot of, written a lot of breakup and post-breakup and healing songs that... Yep. <laughs> but apparently they're all true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all for the, all for the people. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, is, is it all autobiography? I mean, I mean, sometimes you're a man in your song, so obviously. Well, it's autobiographical in that I'm, I might not be doing the first person thing, so I actually enjoy creating a dialogue. I think of a song called Hands Clean, where the verses are me having a dialogue with this person who I then sing about in the chorus. So um, there's something about saying I that creates a very visceral songwriting process for me versus he or she. It distances it if I'm storytelling from afar. But if I'm telling it from within, it's this microcosmic distillation of my human experience. You know, and certain countries think I'm a navel gazer for all that I-ness. But really, it's, it's me offering the story for people to make their own. And it's really indulgent. I mean, part of being an artist, an artist is is expressing yourself. It's part of, you know, I think of it in terms of archetypally. You know, it's like the court jester and the, the philosophers and the artists are these really sort of inward looking creatures who, who comment on what's happening on the planet. So which archetype are you? Depends on the moment. <laughs> I'm the beheading queen in some moments. <laughs> um, Definitely and you yeah. ought to know. <laughs> no, I, you know, sometimes the court jester and sometimes um, the maiden, the mother now. It's pretty, pretty important. Um, yeah, those are the main ones. The, the wife, temptress. Um, <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> yeah. Well, in hands clean. I mean, he's, 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 he seems to be. He, he doesn't seem to take you too uh, seriously as an equal. Me thinks. Yeah, and and there were a lot. There was a lot of ageism, you know. And I, I think about a lot of the young artists in the industry today. And, and I'm curious. I haven't talked with any of them. Maybe at some point I will, but just curious to see if ageism is as rampant as it was when I was younger. You know, it's only now in my 30s that I that it's almost completely gone away. And now the status competition is, well, how many children do you have? You know, it's, <laughs> there's there's always these kind of statusizings happening with people of who's better or worse than. You know, who's got more Grammys? Who's got more children? Who's who's younger? You know, so for me, my whole orientation these days is where can we meet? You know, even if it's just in our humanity or, you know, maybe not in our age or our life circumstance, but we can meet in our humanity. You are the connector. Yeah. The, uh, What's that archetype? That's probably the, um, the midwife crone. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I'll think about it. <laughs> think about it. Yeah. How did it feel to get all that armload of Grammys when you were like that, the youngest at the time? Well, it was an interesting conflict that was going on because on one hand, I had everyone around me saying, be grateful, you know, this is people acknowledging you and you obviously have a hard time being acknowledged, you know. And the irony is, and we talked about this briefly um, before we came on, the irony is that I actually had attention shame. So I, I didn't want to be in front of people, but then I had this part of me that was a ham. So temperamentally, I was terrified all the time. <laughs> so being at the Grammys, it was hard to accept an award in the context of competition in that there were winners and losers. And at the same time, for me not to honor what Jagged Little Pill was would be, you know, would be a crime for, for me not to do that. It would be rude almost, you know. So yeah. I was just conflicted and, and still am in some ways because fame and award shows inherently have a conflict built into them about, because artists, as, you know, in our very nature, I don't think we're very competitive. But you were on The Voice, telling people how to compete. Yes, but I was a mentor. <laughs> <laughs> but was, was it, did, did that, I mean, sometimes I find that trying to explain something helps me understand it better. Yeah, okay. I mean, did that. So explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't explain You're it. like, I can't. No, no, but I, but I was thinking that, you know, you, you're listening to other singers and trying to help them be better. Be them. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that seemed to be your general, like, be more yourself, be more yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't so interested in the outcome. There were plenty of people on set who were. <laughs> so my whole thing was I'll show up as a mentor because I love the thought of being the sister that will offer only <laughs> solicited advice. You know, there was a period of time where I'm so used to not offering unsolicited advice that they actually came and whispered in my ear on a few occasions, you need to give advice. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, right, okay, that's why I'm here. Um, are you sure you want it? Because <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of unsolicited advice sent my way over the years that... Did any help? I was pretty resistant to it. You know, I was very much wanting to learn as I went. And, and my formal true teachers were already in place. I think the importance of mentors and teachers is very important. <laughs> so really, 
I was already in the student teacher relationship in so many different contexts that I actually didn't need 53 other people every week to tell me what to do or what to wear, or what to think, or what to choose. That seems to be not, not your mode, 53 no, people. No, and, and, and when there was an appropriate environment, you know, if I'm collaborating with someone, it's my favorite thing to do, and I'm really open-hearted. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to choose who I get it from. Well, yeah, and you, you, were just a, you were just a little girl, and they, of course, were experts. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and they really didn't understand. I think they thought I was lying when I said I didn't care about certain things, you know. And they didn't understand why I didn't care about certain outcomes. Or they'd say, so did you check the charts this week? <laughs> and I would say no, and they wouldn't believe me. They would say, that's not true. I don't believe you. Well, what is your metric? I mean, what, what, what does... How do I gauge? Yeah. I guess it begs the question, gauge what? You know, so I think my biggest gauge of fulfillment is how I feel when a song is finished. That moment. That moment when I think, wow, that, that says it. That's a really, really sweet, juicy moment. These moments are great, too. I live for dialogue. Well, that's <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But the, that, that, do, you, do you know when a song is finished? I mean, it's just like you, you don't think, oh, if I just fix that line or if I just. Um, no, the mixing process can, can be a, a belabored process. I think it was David Bowie, maybe, who said, you don't finish a song, you abandon it. <laughs> you know? I think the songwriting process, though, I, can, I definitely have the tying of the bow moment where the song is complete. Was there, was there one that, that among the many that, that just like radiates for you that, that was like, I did it, I did it? Well, the song that didn't feel complete and probably will never be complete is the unsent song. <laughs> Huh. I think I had three more verses to it, and I could have kept going. And Glenn, I think Glenn said, "We got to stop. It's 14 minutes long." So, <laughs> so that was ongoing, and, and probably there'll have to be a part two at some point. Um, but I think the songs that are written in a very accelerated way. Um, this record, everything was written very quickly. So celebrity, really, yeah, celebrity was really fast. Edge of Evolution was fast. Um, I was invited not to put that song on the record. Um, I say invited. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think. Well, why not? It might have been a little lofty, perhaps. I don't know. Mm. But it is. It is me. So it was got to give the dog a bone once in a while, you know. You're the boss. <laughs> I'm the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bone. The Do boss you, dog. Um, is it different writing for a movie? Yes, it's much easier writing for a movie really? uh, for me because I get to, in a gestalt kind of way, go into the body of the lead character or whomever I'm writing through, and I just be them for half an hour. And you know, I think of Chronicles of Narnia. I just became Georgie. I think she's eight years old. So I just became her, and I thought, what would be happening if I'm with my brothers and we're royalty, but we're scared? OK, you know, and I just wrote about that. And then uninvited too, just through Meg Ryan's character and Vin Bender's approach too, just thinking, what would it be like if I was falling in love with somebody, but I couldn't be with them, but I wanted to be with them, you know? So it's, it's much easier, because the story's already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's it maybe a vacation from being you. It is. I don't get, I don't have to narcissistically <laughs> focus on myself. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you, I mean, do you worry about being too narcissistic? I mean, it... No, I just think of it as a story. You know, I think stories are so great. It's a way for us to bond. It's so, it's entertaining at worst. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's connective and inspiring and comforting at best. So I was, um, you know, the whole spiritual movement is about, you know, dropping the story. So I tried for a while to drop the story, but then I would wake up in the morning and see my face again. And I'm still <laughs> here. So I think the storytelling part is is the epicenter of why art is so compelling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, also having people see themselves in your story, as you yeah. said. And as long as I don't overly identify with it, I think if I overly identify with something, then as soon as it changes, as soon as I'm no longer 21, or as soon as I'm no longer doing something, then I would be struck with grief nonstop. So as long as the story is, is just the story, it's less uh, traumatizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there songs you've had to abandon because they're not you anymore? Thankfully, there's a timelessness to the Jagged Little Pill songs. Um, 
I think if I were cringing while I, you know, while I was rehearsing, I think I would just not sing it. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that hasn't happened? Not yet. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the songs here and there, I changed the odd word. I'll, I'll change it to the present tense. Or I think there was one song where I said my age as a teenager, so I'd have had to update that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. like uh, jo Joni Mitchell kept having to update uh, Pave Paradise because the parking fees kept going up. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it's it's uh, inflation. That's great. Yeah. That's funny. It's, it's a... Uh, but it, it's 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 a, it's a very coherent career you have in a way because you're 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 always you you're always um, you're you're actually from the beginning you've also always mixed kind of rock and um, a rhythm undercurrent. I mean mm -hmm. it was it was kind of hip hoppy in the early ones and it, mm -hmm. it's very techno-y on on flavors and entanglement. Mm -hmm. I mean I, I mean, like both. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like the. Technological aspect is more kind of masculine and, and um, one side of the brain, and then the, the more organic, warm, earthy, real-time, I think blending those together. This record does that in, 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 a, in a beautiful way, I think. Joe Ciccarelli produced with Guy Sigsworth, so huh. Guy has that sort of technological otherworldliness about him that he brought, and then Joe is very known for warm, rock, lush. So I like that they're both together. Yeah, no, it, it's it's earthier than the last one. It's yeah, it's got more more power chord oomph. More more humans. <laughs> but 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 uh, celebrity just blows my mind that song because it, that that song goes to outer space and back in <laughs> four minutes. Yeah, I mean, was that hard to do? Was right. that was that a complex process recording that? I mean. There's, uh, there's a lot of crazy things going on in that song. There's loops and there's oh, Indian yeah. modes and there's instruments I don't understand. That's Guy Sigsworth for you. <laughs> yeah, he, he will go away and then come back with a whole soundscape that kind of boggles the mind. Definitely boggling. Mm -hmm. um, were, were, were there, do you, do you have a song that, that changed a lot as you recorded it? Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be on the new one. I mean, what, what song people have heard maybe? Yeah, let me think about that. Usually no, because when we record it and record the demo, I think 90% of the vocals on, on this record were recorded in my living room, so. Wow. Um, I'm not overly precious about revisiting once it's finished. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a photo, candid photograph, you know. Well, as long as you're on key. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I read the Jagged Little Pill, most of those, you would do demos, and even if you would fix up the tracks, you would still keep the original takes. Well, Hand in My Pocket is the demo. Um, we went and re-recorded it formally with bandmates, and, and the original demo just beat it. So that's, <laughs> there's a few, especially on Jagged Little Pill, and even now, um, there's a song called Empathy, and that the main core of the demo is still there, and it's untouched. Really? Because mm -hmm. that one really sounds finished. Loved up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, there's Loved up. extra fluffing that happens as we go, but. There, there, there's, I mean, there's a couple of songs on, the, on this album where you actually get what you want. Yeah. Till You and, and Empathy. Yeah. Um, that's almost a change. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's that healing of the interdependence thing. You know, I think where we're moving as a culture and where I'm certainly moving on a personal level is this, this sort of steeliness that I approach life with out of defense and protection um, didn't afford warmth and surrender and, and this connective thing. And I think the women's movement, while it did so much for us, it created this empowerment and liberation, but it didn't create connection and love. So, um, mm. so what I'm experiencing now is the, is the payoff for softening a little bit and trusting a little bit more. Because for me, if I don't trust people, it means I don't trust life or God or anything. But, but, but strangers and business people and everybody? I mean, it seems uh, like you have to be really selective who you trust. Well, discernment is a highly valued quality <laughs> in my life. Yeah, so, discernment, yeah. So you, you're, you're choosing who you trust. Yeah. It's not indiscriminate. And it's, I tiptoe into it, you know. Sometimes I get a little burned and I, ouch. But then I learn that little lesson. <laughs> Did you have, do you have a song that, that, that an, an orphan song in, in, your, in your catalog that you feel like people don't appreciate enough, like a favorite? like one of the non-hits, an album track that, that you really love? Um, there's a song called Simple Together, which uh -huh. is on a DVD that we released that um, 
I remember writing that in my head during sound check on tour years ago. And uh, originally it was uh, a happy song about what, what we were. And then when it came time to write songs for that record, um, I was in the middle of a breakup. So I just flipped it into the negative. <laughs> 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 and it just became, for me, a, a better song. Hmm. A little, little, more, uh, little more heat Emotional, to it. yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the saddest songs I've written, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but sad songs talk to people. Yeah, and for me, if I can do anything, I'd like to, you know, render neutral all emotions, you know, and I'm experiencing that with my son, too, that frustration and disappointment and joy and anger and all of these colors are just emotions, mm -hmm. you know, and that I think it was Gangaji who said, um, spiritual teacher, author, uh, who said that everything has a bottom except for maybe it was joy or love. Mm -hmm. So I've realized that too, is that every emotion that I go all the way into it with inquiry and just facing it and going into it rather than running away from it, it stops, you know, it's just a state. So um, my goal would be to have all these different emotions be all over the records and, and for them to be rendered kind of neutral, you know. But, but, not, but not blanded out, felt, felt but yeah, not checked out, because I can do that really well, too. Yeah, well, you have a song on the album about uh, drugs, about trying to neutralize yeah. every emotion. Yeah, and just seeing drugs for what they are. They are doing a job. <laughs> They're trying to make things less intense or less suffering or less um, difficult to deal with, so they're doing a good job. Did you ever have a phase of that? My addictions were really food and love and um, work. Work is kind of the respectable addiction in the West, you know. People are very proud to say that they're working till four in the morning and it, it actually can be a bit of a problem. So I'd say those ones Not are the chemicals. big ones. Chemicals are fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're awesome and I think they can be great, you know, depending upon whose hands they're in or, or whose hands they're in during certain times or circumstances. Um, they can be lovely portals to the divine and they can kind of snap you out of a certain perspective. And, you know, I've, I've known a lot of people who've really used them as ways to sort of catalyze a spiritual shift or... But, um, but I never sort of fell down the slippery slope into those ones, even though they're fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they are. Yeah, no, that, well, also, I have a theory that, because I'm so obsessed with the developmental stages, I have a theory that, especially that attachment stage, if it's not nailed or done well enough, um, that we wind up seeking certain, certain drugs that speak to certain wounds. So I think that attachment wound speaks directly to people craving opiates and heroin, because and, that warmth that you feel with the skin-on-skin -skin mama falling into the mom arms and the dad's skin, if we don't have that, it's pre-cognitive, pre you know, it's mm -hmm. pre-verbal. So if we don't have it, we crave it. You know? So a lot of you know, recovering addicts I've spoken with, yeah. I, can, I, can, I get a general sense of, of where the thwarted stage of development was. Cocaine's really great for competence. There's a stage of development that is, I guess, the fourth stage of development, according to Harville Hendricks, that <laughs> is about learning competence, and cocaine can do that for some people. Hmm. Well, in supposed former infatuation junkie, which I was afraid I was going to mispronounce, <laughs> um, yeah. you're, you're in, on the inside, you're there in fetal position. You're, right. you're in the womb. Yeah. I mean, so you must have been craving some... Some. some. <laughs> Some attachment. Yeah, I, I, I needed Snuggies a lot, and when I, and when I wouldn't get the spooning, um, I would just figure out other creative ways to get it, you know, because I was hungry, and I actually thought fame would create deeper connections with people, but it did the opposite, because now not only was I um, recognized, but there was a lot of preconceived notions about who I was, which were sometimes erroneous, sometimes accurate. So I wound up being the watched one as opposed to the connected one, you know. So I, I went from people watching to be watched, neither of which affords a real connection. And so it's been a lot of work on my part to, to foster the real connection beyond those two. Well, how do you deal with that, though? Because, I mean, you know, 33 million people have, have, you, have, your, have your face on their record shelf. Yeah. I mean, is, is it, 
how do you, how do you step back from that? Uh, a lot of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. I still have PTSD from those times, you know. Hmm. Um, there'll be times where I'll be super paranoid and someone will say, there's no one here, Alanis. <laughs> so I just, you know, um, they're looking at me. No, they're not. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, so there's that, um, but I also do see the ability uh, to have sort of a telepathic and energetic connection with people in general, mm -hmm. and there's a certain kind of animal that comes to my shows. They're, they seem to be very thoughtful, smart, um, deeply feeling, deeply attuned creatures. So there's a wink that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I was, I was, I was thinking because, you know, somebody's looking. I mean, when you're on stage, somebody is looking. Right. And, and you're happy for it and they're happy for it. I mean, yeah. is, it, is, that, is that? It was an accelerated course in boundaries for me. You know, really? No matter where I walked, there were hotel rooms I would return to after playing. I think of this one time in Australia where I came back to my hotel room and there were notes slipped in my bed and my suitcase. And, and just there, were, there was really nowhere I could go. I couldn't leave my hotel room because people would be waiting in the hallways, jumping on the car. You know, it was, it was intense. My hair was being ripped out. So I just, I, I think during that time, I, I just remember thinking that if this is the way it was going to be, that I definitely didn't want to be here anymore. And no one had told me that it would shift. You know, and what I love about the new climate right now is that fostering real intimacy and transparency, I was, if I can name drop for a second, I was talking with Katy Perry backstage at the Ellen DeGeneres show and she said, she's promoting her show, right, her movie right now. And she said, wow, it's really intense to be this transparent. And I said, you know, transparency is the new mystery in this climate <laughs> because, because it's, it's what people want. They want to sort of peek behind the curtain and not a moment too soon, you know, because it, it levels the playing field and, and creates a sort of humanity amongst us celebrities. But isn't it more work, more time? Yeah, I think it's, it's worth it. To, so, so you're out there blogging, Twittering, showing yourself more? Yeah. I always wanted to, though. I think, mm -hmm. you know, someone from Warner Brothers a few years ago said, hey, isn't it cool that all these I crazy ideas you had, you know, 15 years ago, now people want them from you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> so there was a time where I'd had similar ideas to what we're doing now in terms of sharing more, but nobody wanted to hear it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, they, they were used to squeezing it through the distribution channel and silence. And yeah, then... and they were actually invested in keeping keeping the audience and the artists separate, you know, because it would sell more records or keep them hungry or whatever it is. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, do you think about, um, you're still pretty committed to the album as an album? Yeah. You it's like a, that form? It's a snapshot. You know, and if someone wants to get a song for 99 cents, that's fine. But I, <laughs> I, I love the idea of sharing a whole group of songs. Definitely. Well, they talk to each other. They do. They, they, they're... Um, they're brothers and sisters. <laughs> yeah. But the, I mean, you always have an incredible overflow, though. Yeah. Um, do, 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 do those ever come back for the next album? Sometimes I'll give them to charity albums. There's a, a song called, I think, 2020 that I gave to David Lynch's foundation. So sometimes I'll sit on a song that is a gem for me, you know, a little secret. And then some opportunity will present itself. A magical child on Every Mother Counts with Christy Turlington. So I sit on them and I kind of, I wait for the perfect opportunity to share them. Yeah, because each, each time you do an album, it's a different sound world. Yeah, and a different place that I'm coming from. But, but I have, uh, I feel very abundant with the songs now. There was a period of time where I didn't trust the process, hmm. but now I trust it. So if a song doesn't see the light of day, there's more where that came from. <laughs> yeah, That's good. Yeah. Do, you, do you have to get into a certain frame of mind to, to write, or, you, or are they just like bursting out of the iPhone without you? Um, sometimes they wake me up in the middle of the night. If I, if I haven't spent enough time alone during the day, I can be assured that I will be awoken at uh, wow. 4 a.m. By a song? Yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a hard balance to do if you're touring bring up a child. Yeah, it's all about the like, now the iPhone or a piece of paper by the side of the bed for sure so that I can get it out and go back to sleep. <laughs> Do you, and you wake up in the morning and it's actually pretty good? Yeah, uh, unlike when you're high and you write a song. <laughs> 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 it's actually good when I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> 
I had the greatest song. It's, it's like, genius. And then you look at it, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, maybe that's a, a trance song. Yeah, um, yeah, it could be. <laughs> I was actually, you know, you could you could put out Straight Jacket now, right. now that everything's dance pop. Right, do a new remix. You it's could, <laughs> but but you were sort of ahead of you were you were you were anticipating what would happen four years later. Yeah, a lot of times I I I, I get a general sense, even just on an energetic level, of where we're going, and you know, I could I could take credit for the being ahead of my time thing, but I'll just stick with the. You know, I, I almost get a snapshot in my head or in my ears of, of what's coming. And that doesn't mean that I need to do it, you know. Huh. There's a period of time a little while ago where I just, I, I heard this whole electronica world, you know, seven years ago. I just thought, oh, I think I know what's going to happen. And then that doesn't mean I need to make that record. It's just I, I can feel it coming like a wave. Hmm. But if you were a record guy, you would record. If you, you were at Warner Brothers, you'd say, oof, jump on that. Or you wouldn't. I think a lot of people in, in the record industry, they were terrified of genre creations because they were often in the business of repeating what had already been successful. So they were terrified of the idea of trying something that was risky. Do, 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 you, do you try to zig where other people are zagging? Not purposefully, and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I zag right along with people, and other times I don't. Um, it depends on what I am inspired by, you know. And the, and the song tells you what, what clothing it needs? Yeah, it does. And a lot of record companies, too, I think, were just, they were just afraid of, of it not working. But I think part of what's exciting is trying something that could, is just scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of record companies, you were on Maverick, which was Madonna's label. Did, you, did she ever poke her nose in and say, you know, those are pretty good songs, Alanis, or, or was it? I think I was on a television show once in Barcelona, and the song ended, and they said, we have a special message from Madonna for you. And I was in my 20s, so I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat up straight, and the message was, keep selling records, Alanis. <laughs> 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 Artistic inspiration mm. at its finest. Hey. <laughs> That's funny. You, you switch now to, are you more in control now? Or were you always in control? Um, I was always in control of my jurisdiction. Well, yeah. which is, which is how the record the sounds? Yeah, and the videos and everything. what I wore. I really love visual interpretation of things. So sometimes I would direct a video or sometimes I would write a treatment or sometimes I would do none of that. Mm -hmm. And, and it, so the new arrangement is the same? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, there is more freedom now, though. There's more partnerships. There's the, the contracts are conscionable now. It's actually <laughs> a win-win, whereas before, even though record companies would argue with me about it, it was never a win-win. It was the old paradigm of win-lose. Well, how, how did you win and lose? Well, I mean, in the, in the context of my life, it's always been a win for me, but the relationship contractually was never skewed 50-50 or both people walking away from the contract being happy. It was more they were the only route through which to share the music, so you had to take a lot on the chin. Right, and now that's completely changed. Exactly, and so there's a lot of empowerment that's happening with artists now. There's no more Prince with the question, oh no, didn't he write Slave? Or slave. Um, there's no more of that going on, you know, these days because artists are actually entering into one record cycle contracts and I think the the dawn of the digital era really brought the light in it was shone on on how antiquated and archaic really a lot of these contracts were transparency yeah <laughs> it yep. even hit the business it did thank god not a moment too soon that's good um in a couple of minutes um we're going to let you guys ask some questions there'll be people in the aisles with microphones and I know you're not shy, so um, do, do, uh, do sort of think about your question and, and line up. <laughs> Interesting lighting cue. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, indeed. Um, OK, you were first. Hi, Eric. Hi, Linus. <laughs> um, this might seem really superficial, but uh, your hair is absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> and Thanks. What, what do you use to make it look so awesome? <laughs> Seriously, because it's always been beautiful throughout the years. 
glad you thought it was greasy. Thanks. <laughs> um, so Thanks. Advise me, please. Well, today I didn't do my hair, so I can't answer for today. But um, in general, um, I was using Kerastase for a long time. <laughs> And nowadays, I'm using more of the sort of natural, natural ones. I love Eminence and uh, Jason products. <laughs> Thank you. So, so can I ask, was, was the Medusa hair real or is this real? The snakes? Yeah, the snakes. Um, the ringlets, the curls. Oh, that, that's real. This is straightened. This is straightened. OK, I, was, yeah. I never knew. Yeah. Um, go <laughs> ahead. That's funny. Hi, Alanis. Thanks Hi. for all the great music you've, you've given us through the years. Thank you. This is a stupid question, but what was the first record you ever bought? The Smurfs All-Star Show. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first record, oh, Wham, probably. And who yeah. inspires you today? Uh, Wham. <laughs> um, actually. Uh, was it Careless Whisper? What was it? <laughs> it was the Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. Wake Me Up Before It was a cassette. Go -go. Um, who inspires me today? Uh, a lot of rap music because my husband is is pulling me through the orientation process. Um, and what else do I love these days? I listen to a lot of classical music a little bit with my son just to kind of balance out the rap thing. Um, and I like Gautier a lot. Basically, I like music where it's you know probably not surprisingly autobiographical, really super melodic. I'm listening to Tom York the last few days again. Just people who are really inspired and they kind of channel their music. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, I, I just want to tell you that I love you. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you about the, um, what you said about the drugs and the um, stages of development. Mm. I'm a therapist and mm. I believe that too, but I don't have it clear like you do. Mm. So. Even if you could, I, I know you probably don't want to talk about that like at length, but yeah. even if you could write an article or a blog about it. Cool, I'll write an article about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be really hard, but I'll do it. <laughs> but, but that's what you do, right? You don't yeah. do the easy stuff. Yeah, no. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Alanis. I particularly liked Ironic uh, a lot. Oh, Thank cool. You. Great. Um, at one point in this talk, you said that you were talking about the sweetness of the end of a song, and then you said, but this is sweet right here, this dialogue that we're having, mm. and that you live for dialogue or, or something like that. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate on what you mean by the sweetness of dialogue, and particularly these times talks, or, or just any dialogue you've had with, with people. What, is the, what did you mean by that? Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, thanks. Um, I like the third entity that is created between two people or, or a room. You know, so there's me and there's you in this case, but what are we talking about? You know, so to take the micro to the macro, to keep going back and forth between the personal and the universal or the personal and the global, you know, and, and I think it allows me not to feel that my story is so precious. And it also allows me to figure out what my unique form of service is. You know, some people want to address symptoms, building schools in Africa, and, you know, and my, my service mostly takes the form of of sort of social, spiritual, psychological activism. And we all have our unique take. Um, I think that sort of answers that. Does that answer that enough? Yeah, thank you okay. very much. Well, I mean, yeah. ther therapy is a monologue, right? It can be. It depends if, you know, if it's a good therapist. It's yeah. not, actually. But, but I mean, you, you, want the, you, want, you want the other person to push you a little bit. Yeah, and I think, I think even therapy is evolving to the point where you know, ther therapy, beautifully so, is all about ethics and boundaries and watching transference. And, and I think what's happening nowadays, you know, don't touch your client. And what's happening nowadays is, is that boundary is softening a little bit. And, and we're, f we're finding, as though I'm a therapist, we're finding that empathy and relatability and connection is actually healing, you know. Mm. So even therapy has changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, a quick follow-up question. As an interviewer, do you feel that sweetness? Do you get in that that magical mode when you're interviewing someone? I really like talking to a smart person. <laughs> Me too. Go ahead. So you played God, which I thought was, you know, very inspired casting. Um, Live casting. <laughs> well, got me to see the movie, got me into that. Oh, cool. um, and you talked earlier about visualizing chords and songs as colors. Mm -hmm. And so 
on that note, if I ask you to, now to think about a visual or personification for God, the universe, for whatever you believe in, mm -hmm. what comes to your mind? Well, I think if the universal sound is om, then, then the universal word is yes. Um, and the universal color would be uh, probably the rainbow. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, Alanis, how are you? I am uh, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity, and I just want to say thank you for all your music. It's been amazing to listen to you, watch you grow through the years. Thanks. Um, I know, every, and, and I loved it too, Jagged Little Pill is a fantastic album, but what played such a significant role in my growth was Under Rug Swept. Hmm. A, a, a huge, huge, I mean, it really impacted my life incredibly. Oh, yeah, cool. And, yeah, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And, um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question. Like, one of the things that I noticed about following you is after you came home from India, your whole affect seemed to have changed. Mm -hmm. What happened over there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy that you're happy. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> and and, and I, I don't want to say anyone's saying angry for you forever, yeah. but I mean, like, but you just had came back with such a great sense of calm and, and self assurance. And I didn't. Hmm. And I, would love to know what happened over there. Um, I think it was after the, the hailstorm that was the Jagged Little Pill experience. So I became disillusioned in, in a very beautiful, horrifying way with, with what I was sold um, as being the thing to strive for. You know, I grabbed pretty much every brass ring that as an artist you can grab. I had won the awards. I was in the Guinness Book of World Records. All the egoic, gratifying things, you know, check. And so all the pictures of goalfulness had disappeared. And so I thought, well, the screen's gone black. Am I supposed to die now? Like, <laughs> you know, so when I went over there, you know, India for me is just like altars on every street corner. So everyone's praying just by walking around and people look you in the eye. And, you know, it was just a whole different experience for me. So I felt like a human being, and there was an intimacy there that I experienced with my own self and with spirit. And I was reading all these spiritual texts while I was over there. So um, that was a big part of it. But I noticed that when I came back and wrote thank you and then went on tour again, mm -hmm. that I got sucked back into ego. <laughs> you know, so it, you know, I went back into samsara <laughs> pretty quickly. And I, you know, it's, it's a, for me, it's an unfoldment over a period of time. In my case, I know some people who had an awakening that changed everything forever, like Eckhart Tolle and all these people talk about, it changed in an instant. Mm -hmm. For me, it's been fits and starts, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I'm very grateful, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, also, those guys didn't have to go back and perform in arenas. Right. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very different life to, I mean, you couldn't go into the contemplative life. You had to, right. I mean, you had to go out and be the star. Right, and that was the question. I thought maybe I was supposed to go back into the contemplative life, but, it sucked me back in. <laughs> you know. Well, to, 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 to do a different kind of service, I think. Yeah, yeah, a different kind. Also, the kind that speaks to the integration of everything, the integration of the story and the witness and consciousness and the messiness of life, you know, to blend all that together versus just be good. I, you know, I'd rather be whole and, and, and speak about the holistic experience of being human versus just trying to be zend out all the time. As in, this could get messy. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the, yeah. Um, your voice changed, though, because on Jagged Little Pill, you're really, you're shrieking a lot. Yeah, a lot of piercing. Um, and uh, he, he, he was right, a calm comes into your voice. You have, a, I mean, you can still scream. Mm -hmm. You can still get really nasty and be the beheading queen. But, <laughs> but, but you can also, but, but, but there's another, there's a calmer layer, a serene layer, too, that comes in. Yeah, I mean, that's part did, of did, growing up, I think. Thank God. Did, did, did you hear it as, a, I mean, because songwriting is physical, too. Songwriting is, mm -hmm. my voice is going to be saying this. Yeah, I remember when I handed Jagged Little Pill in, a record company person said, we just need to reapproach this whole record. It's way too caustic. I had no idea this is what you were going to do. And I, <laughs> and I remember thinking, well, I'm 19 or I'm, I'm 20. This is caustic. If you want a Steely Dan record, wait 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so then I released it as it was. Caustic and all. Yeah. Um, where were we? I think it's your turn. Hi, Alex. Hi. You look really pretty today. I have a question. Thanks. What do you 
think about like X Factor, American Idol, all the shows like that that are out nowadays that they weren't long ago? Um, I think those shows are about performing. You know, so it's a God-given gift to be able to use your voice in that way and to perform, you know, dancing, sometimes acting, not always, and, and singing in that way is performance. So these shows are performance shows. It seems like it's more easy now for people to become famous than back then, like, you know, you had to work your ass off, like, you're a songwriter and you wrote amazing albums and, like, people now go on TV and I think it's like, the industry changed so much since, like, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, like, like you said, everything has changed. Everything's turned around iTunes, yeah. Facebook, Twitter, everything. But I don't yeah. know if those shows really make stars. I mean, some, somebody wins and they make an album and they disappear if they don't have something beyond performing, if they don't have something. Oh, yeah, of course. They're like karaoke contests sometimes. That's right. I mean, they're, they're singing other people's songs, they're great, and then you say, but who are you? And they're gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. and, and a few people survive them. I mean, a few people, that's their avenue. Yeah, and, and a lot of people are, are vocalists, you know, and they have no intention to write autobiographical songs. It's, no. it's not interesting to them, you know, so that's the perfect forum for them. And it's stressful, and yeah. America loves stress. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're touring in Europe over the summer, but what about a U.S. tour? We'll be touring in North America in the fall. <laughs> is, there, is there any way that you can make a fan dream come true by taking a picture with me? Say that part again. I say, would there be any way you can make a fan dream come true by taking a picture of me? Why don't we do it at the end? Come, come find. <laughs> Thank you so much. Go ahead. Hi, Alonis. My name's Adam. Hi. And I think I've been waiting since I was 15 years old to even speak with you. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm 32 now. Now we know how old uh, you are. <laughs> I swear, ask my mom. She wasn't happy about it. <laughs> but um, your albums have connected to me. And I, I'm sitting there racking my brain for the past couple months since I bought the tickets of what I was going to say to you or what kind of question I was going to to ask you. Mm -hmm. And then you said it for me. You said, you know, you, write, you really like this whole soundtrack of, of, of my life and all this stuff. And I said, mm. you know what, that is what you've been to me. Mm. Has been a soundtrack to my life. Mm. Every single album, every single song. I mean, I remember I was going to New York for three months and I was living in New York and I was listening to um, your second album and I'm nervous, so I couldn't really say it. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> and I would just listen to it and, I, and it would just make me feel at home. And I have mm. a very good friend who I've known my entire life and uh, she's very ill, but our song is Head Over Feet, mm. and it's just been something that has got me through a lot with her, mm. and I wanted to say thank you. Mm, you're welcome. So that's really it, so it's not a question, it's just I really had to say that, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I really, really wanted to thank you. Hi, Alanis. Hi. Uh, there were a number of songs that you put out or that you wrote in between Jagged Little Pill and supposed former infatuation junkie like London and Gorgeous oh, yeah. that you played a few times. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular reason that most of those songs kind of fell by the wayside for what was then on the album? Um, those songs were written on tour. We were touring for a long time, so I was dying to write songs. So we'd write songs during sound check. Or, um, and I think for a long time after Jagged Little Pill came out, there were a lot of people, some of whom were m even in the public eye, who were quick to say, oh, she's just been sven by Glenn Ballard. And so I'd like to say that I didn't care at the time about those comments, but I did. So I think I went away and just wrote a ton of songs alone that weren't intended to be shared publicly. They were just intended for me to maybe prove to my own self that I didn't need. <laughs> There's that autonomy thing again. I didn't need a collaborator, you know, and I did prove that to myself. I don't need a collaborator, but I really do enjoy that process. So that's what those songs were, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Hi, Lance. Um, Hi. As a person that's in the academia and somebody that's a confessional poet, I really feel the interconnectedness of those two. You know, how you said that everything's connected, you're looking for the greater picture. and. Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote an MA thesis that has to do with you. Oh, cool. Bit. <laughs> it's called The Construction of Feminism in the Work of Modern American Female Authors, from Sylvia Plath to Alanis Morissette. Wow. So my first part of the question, could I give you a copy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's a plug-in. But uh, the second part is, how do you feel about, um, I've had to do a lot of research, and there's so many articles about your songs, about the subject in general. How do you feel about people interpreting your songs in this academical kind of environment and way? 
Um, I think it's great because for a long time I, I felt like church and state had to be separated. I felt like I could either be psychological or I could be sort of emotional, spiritual, but that I couldn't blend the both. And before transpersonal psychology, even in the therapeutic community, there was no blending. Right. It was science was over here, you know, spirituality, new movement over here, and then, you know, the artists were over here. You know, so for me, I always, it was a conflict for me because I wanted to figure out which one I could be and, and any given hat was not enough. And I remember the UK press, which is they're pr particularly vicious over there, um, press-wise. You know, they were saying psycho babble, and you know, I'm just like, well, that's what I am. I'm a geeky student who is happens to have a voice and happens to be able to sing. So for me, it was about integrating all of that together. And nowadays, it seems there's so much integration going on because of our evolution that that's welcomed now, whereas even 10 years ago, I don't think it was as welcomed in, in the academic communities. And, and now I, you know, I had the privilege of speaking with Dan Siegel on stage at UCLA, and the therapeutic community is now going, oh, it's okay for us to look outside of our wheelhouse. It's safe to look outside of our science. Or, you know, and I, I think a lot of even some of the older generations, teachers and professors and well-known authors are seeing that us coming together is, is the way to go. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, my comment could be very brief and embarrassing, um, <laughs> if I'm Perfect. mistaken. Is, um, I'm, I've been a fan of yours, and he was saying he's 32, I'm 39, so I might have known for a little bit longer. But I'm pretty sure you were on like my favorite show. Which and I, it's such an honor to meet from You Can't Do That on Television. Uh, <laughs> it's, I'm more starstruck, and I've been you know, subscribing to all of your music, and you've been very influential, but I'm, I'm thinking green slime, and <laughs> there's, I'm very honored to meet you oh, in yeah, this you and talk about You Can't Do That on Television, yeah. especially after someone discussed their thesis. So yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, what was that like getting slimed? I mean, you were, you, were, you were a baby. Yeah, it was my coming into a whole world that had Show already business. been established, you know. So there were, there's so many horrifying moments in there. And, <laughs> you know, it was, it was not easy for me. <laughs> was it fun at all, or was it just, I have to do this? The classes were fun. There were, there were um, acting classes that were part of being on the show, and those were the most fun for me. The show itself was really uh, intimidating, and I was the newcomer. And then I was also the girl that Alistair and Adam were fighting over on the show, so I got all this hate mail. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. Uh, well, you look amazing. Thanks. First of all, your roots are amazing. Your hair looks amazing. <laughs> um, just saying. Um, you know, for years, I mean, since the beginning, I've been a fan of yours, and I feel like I've grown with you, and really, I've really appreciated you evolving and, and the different styles and the different way that you've grown and I feel like I've grown with you and something I've really connected to is your humor and I feel like we would be really good friends. <laughs> um, I really do. I mean, oh, seriously, please. face with me, please. Um, <laughs> like, like, you know, I think you should really revisit like Bubble Trouble. Oh, okay. You know, on the new, on the new albums. But okay, like, great. have you noticed or have you um, thought about doing like a, you know, series or a sitcom or, you know, more of that as far as like a, a serial thing as opposed to you know, one-offs on up all night or weeks Cameos. or whatever. Cameos, yeah. Yeah, I think comedy is a divine form of art. You know, I think humor, you know, whenever I think of my greatest spiritual teachers, they're usually the funniest people I've ever yeah. met. So, um, yeah, I don't know what form it'll take over the years, but for me to, to not have something comedically present in my life would be a very sad life for me. Agreed. Yeah. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Alanis. Hi. My name's Raphael, and uh, I have a question for you about your so-called Chaos album. I noticed that album was very different from a lot of your albums. I know you cut your hair, and you know you went through all of that. Um, that trauma. Uh, uh, which is great. I love Alanis in any flavor. So. Thank you. Thank you for as unconditionally accepting. As far as the um, so-called Chaos, I noticed the song structures for a lot of those tracks were very verse one chorus, verse two, chorus, mm. um, chorus, bridge, and also the title of it, so-called chaos, is a, a title track of a, of a song, which usually you take, you know, your title, your album titles will usually be from lyrics, so right. I'm just wondering, was that album 
different for you as far as how you created it or the process? Was there anything different about that Did I produce that one? That I don't album? remember what I did with that one. So-called chaos. Yeah. No, I know the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You might have heard of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> although I did, I did make a bet with someone that I was working with where he said there was a certain song on a record of mine, and I said, I can guarantee you it's not on that record. And he said, I'll, I'll make a bet with you. And I said, I'm so sure that it's not on that record that I'm going to bet you 500 bucks it's not on that record. And I was wrong. <laughs> so I gave him the money. And, um, so your question was about that time period. Um, I think that time period, that particular song that made it so that the record was sort of worthy, in my opinion, of being titled that song title was um, was the fear I had of letting go of control, and you know the, the big question that is always posed around control for me is you know what would you be most afraid of you know and can you even go into that worst fear and then that worst fear and it really comes down to death you know because that is usually the lowest common denominator of every fear that I have you know whether it's humiliation or reputation or aging or whatever it is it's this fear of being ostracized lonely. Did. So that song really, to me, spoke to this fear of, the, of, of what felt like could be chaos if I really were to surrender in the way a lot of my teachers were asking me to do. So I had, the record had to be titled that. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Go ahead. We're, we're, go, we're, we're short on time, so be quick. Hi, my name is Tamara, I'm from Croatia, so English is my second language, and I want to thank you for using so many SAT words in your songs that improved my English tremendously. And I just want to ask you, so you covered Seals are Crazy and Stings King of, King of Pain, so I wondered, is there any song in the world that you think, oh man, I wish I wrote that one? Um, Teardrop by Massive Attack, mm. that song kills me. Um, and the Gotche song, somebody I used to know. Oh, totally. yeah. I have I have song envy on that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but who who's going to do the other? Uh, who's going to do this the duet part? It'll be a man or a woman. A man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, chasing cars for me was another beautiful song that. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Alanis. Hi. Um, my heart's beating like crazy now. Yeah. Um, I, first of all, I want to say I'm so grateful to you because you've been such a huge inspiration to me. And I think your presence in my life is a huge part of who I am today. Uh, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, as a songwriter, um, because I heard you speak so much about, uh, so many times, about that stream of consciousness mode where you just write something that's being channeled through you. And I find a lot of times that when I write, I have a lot of ideas, and when I try to put them down, they're not as poignant as I would want them to be, or it's not expressed the way I would want to share it. Mm -hmm. And I find that there's a lot of grinding and a lot of working at it until it becomes something that I would want to do. So that I would want to share. So I was wondering about your process, if you have sometimes things that you edit a lot or that you grind towards something that you know you want to say, but it doesn't always come out the way that you want to say it. Or I don't know, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think I understand <laughs> what you're sharing. Um, for me, if there's an over-efforting, it usually means I'm not supposed to be doing it. So that doesn't mean that I don't value showing up and the major energy it takes to write something or it's exhausting even when we're doing what we we're supposed to be doing, you know. But then sometimes if I'm efforting my way through something, that's a pretty clear indication that I can either soften the whip or or maybe I'm not supposed to be writing that song or maybe I'm not supposed to be trying to make it be something that I intellectually think it should be and and perhaps rather I could see what it's supposed to be you know so I love lyrics that are conversational and and sometimes conversations are really simple so that could be the song and you know I remember, uh, uh, what's her name, Lori Berkner is a, is a woman who writes songs for children. And she, I read a quote from her the other day, I'm obsessed with children's songs now for obvious reasons. Um, and they haunt me at night. But, um, 
but she, I read a quote from her yesterday because I was obsessed with her thinking, does she have children? Tell me about this woman. And I would need to kiss her feet. <laughs> but she wrote, she said in this interview that she couldn't write and she was having a really hard time writing songs with her band. And then one day, I, it may have been after she had a child, she started writing kids songs and then it came really effortlessly for her. So to me, that was a clear indication of she wasn't writing yet what she was born to write. And then when she was, there was a flow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Hi, Alanis. I'm just Hi. a few years older than you, and your Jagged Little Pill was not just a soundtrack for being 25, but the albums after were like an evolution and a journey for a woman to know, OK, so that's what I feel, or that's what comes next. And I've been stuck on everything for a really long time. Oh, cool. Which that's is, a good one to get It stuck is, on. but I can't get beyond the, you know, the ups and the downs. Um, uh, but my question from, I think, our collective office is, when you write, do you write in what we term all caps? The anger and the passion, or the passion that you sing with, is it there when you write, or is it just the writing, and then the emotion of how you sing it is something that comes later? Or do you know when you write how you're going to sing it? Um, I know how I'm going to sing it when I write it. The whole thing is there for you as a package. Mm -hmm. What a gift. And you look great post baby, so what'd you do? <laughs> what'd you do? Thank you. Exercise. Any more Ironman triathlons? Or say, say Any day. more Ironman triathlons, or how'd you do it? Not this week. <laughs> oh. uh, at some point, you know, I, I have this fantasy of doing charity marathons with my kids one day, but. By the time I get there, I probably won't no. do that. Keep inspiring us. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> a couple more. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Hi. I did Facebook you today, but I don't know if it was you or not, but I said, if it's the real you, I want you to know I'm coming tonight. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you have just increased the size of my life. You're the voice behind me finding a voice, and I'm sure you hear these stories all the time but I still need to say it. 17 years ago, I started my journey of recovery from bulimia, cool. and you were there, and your songs were there, and they taught me I did not have to be perfect, and that the only way out was through, and that uh, sometimes I was going to be the most boring person, and sometimes I'd be the most exciting person, and to live and learn and laugh and to walk away from the eight easy steps that I knew too well. <laughs> and it's just been amazing. Hmm. And uh, I didn't think I could be more, have you be more endeared to me. And then I come in here tonight and you're talking about being your own mother as you learn to mother. Hmm. And that was a really big theme for me. Hmm. And uh, I'm also gonna be a person who may be stepping on boundaries, and, but I am going to ask you to read my book. I did give it yeah. to somebody. Okay, great. It's called The Size of My Life, and I talk about you in it, and I talk about the only way out is through. Every time people were trying to tell me, you know, go around, forget the past, don't deal with it, I say, no, the only way out is through. Mm. Thank you, you're, you're just amazing. Thank yeah, you for thank this you. opportunity. Wow. Um, yeah. let, let's do the last two. Is this a duet question? Yeah. <laughs> Sisters or twins. Hi. Um, hi. It's our birthday today, and she surprised me with tickets to this, so yeah. that was oh. exciting. Um, no, okay, so when we were six years old, our mother introduced us to your Jagged Little Pill album, and it really... <laughs> <laughs> she was a great mom. <laughs> and she... Uh, it really has paved the path that we grew up on to be independent and strong and empowered, <laughs> just like you. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, basically, like, um, just some advice. What would you give to just young girls? Young 20 something year olds in the city, just out of college. Yeah. <laughs> Every opportunity at our hands. Um, I would say that independence is, is a great part of the journey, but that interdependence is kind of where it's at now, and that it's okay to depend on each other. Yeah, Thank we're social you. creatures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Alanis. My name is Liz, and I'm a huge fan of yours. I discovered your Jagged Little Pill album when I was 10 years old. I'm now 27. Um, and I actually have gotten your tat I got an Atlantis tattoo on my foot. I have the words <laughs> that I would be good on my foot. Oh, wow. um, because that song really spoke to me the most, but all of your songs have spoken to me. Mm. And um, I'm also a writer. I'm also a uh, soon-to-be therapist. Wow. Um, and I wanted to know, one of the things that moves me the most about you is your lyrics. Anytime I open a CD, I always tore open, read the lyrics before I even put the CD in the CD player. And lyrics always spoke to me. That's why my first tattoo was song lyrics and yours. I want to know, are you going to come out with a book? 
ever? I heard that you were in the process of writing one or contemplating writing a book. Yeah, I've been uh, contemplating for a long time. <laughs> I have about 800 pages. Wow, that's um, a lot of contemplation. Yeah. That's impressive. That's it is. Um, so, uh, yes, my friend, uh, Debbie Ford, uh, spoke with me the other day and she said, what's up with this book, Alanis? And I said, well, I thought I'd write it before I gave birth, but that was a naive thought. Um, and uh, now that this record is out, I, I am not able to focus on it right now, but she said when I come off this tour that she will personally <laughs> make sure this book gets finished. So I'm going to take her up on that. Great. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you so much for, this, for being here, for this opportunity, and you really you changed my life and helped me through a lot of difficult times, so thank you. Yeah, thank I you. I love you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Folks, we've we yeah. got we to gotta wrap up. I, I really appreciate you all coming. I really yeah. appreciate you thank opening you your heart. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs>